2 Chronicles chapter 8 At the end of twenty years, during which Solomon built the temple of the Lord and his own palace, Solomon rebuilt the villages that Hiram had given him and settled Israelites in them. Solomon then went to Hamath-Zobah and captured it. He also built up Tadmor in the desert and all the store cities he had built in Hamath. He rebuilt Upper Beth-Horan and Lower Beth-Horan as fortified cities, with walls and with gates and bars, as well as Beela and all his store cities, and all the cities for his chariots and for his horses. Whatever he desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and throughout all the territory that he ruled. There were still people left from the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These people were not Israelites. Solomon conscripted the descendants of all these people remaining in the land, whom the Israelites had not destroyed, to serve as slave labor, as it is to this day. But Solomon did not make slaves of the Israelites for his work. They were his fighting men, commanders of his captains, and commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also King Solomon's chief officials, 250 officials supervising the men. Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter up from the city of David to the palace he had built for her, for he said, My wife must not live in the palace of King David of Israel, because the places the ark of the Lord has entered are holy. On the altar of the Lord that he built in front of the portico, Solomon sacrificed burnt offerings to the Lord, according to the daily requirements for offerings commanded by Moses for the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the three annual festivals, the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. In keeping with the ordinance of his father David, he appointed the divisions of the priests for their duties, and the Levites to lead the praise and to assist the priests according to each day's requirement. He also appointed the gatekeepers by divisions for the various gates, because this was what David the man of God had ordered. They did not deviate from the king's commands to the priests or to the Levites in any matter, including that of the treasuries. All Solomon's work was carried out, from the day the foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid until its completion. So the temple of the Lord was finished. Then Solomon went to Ezion Jeba and Elath on the coast of Edom. And Hiram sent him ships commanded by his own men, sailors who knew the sea. These, with Solomon's men, sailed to Ophir, and brought back four hundred and fifty talents of gold, which they delivered to King Solomon. 2 Chronicles chapter 9 When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. Arriving with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba saw the wisdom of Solomon, as well as the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, the cup-bearers in their robes, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be! How happy your officials, who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom! Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as king to rule for the Lord your God. Because of the love of your God for Israel and his desire to uphold them forever, he has made you king over them to maintain justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. There had never been such spices as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon brought gold from Ophir. 
They also brought algam wood and precious stones. The king used the algam wood to make steps for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace, and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. Nothing like them had ever been seen in Judah. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for. He gave her more than she had brought to him. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, not including the revenues brought in by merchants and traders. Also, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the territories brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of hammered gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold, with 300 shekels of gold in each shield. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with pure gold. The throne had six steps, and a footstool of gold was attached to it. On both sides of the seat were armrests, with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on the six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold, and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships, manned by Hiram servants. Once every three years it returned, carrying gold, silver and ivory, and apes and baboons. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold, and robes, weapons, and spices, and horses and mules. Solomon had four thousand stalls for horses and chariots, and twelve thousand horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the river Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from all other countries. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Nathan the prophet? in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Ido the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for forty years. Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son succeeded him as king. Acts chapter 16 Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace 
and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Theatira, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, no, oh, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Psalm 148 Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord from the heavens! Praise Him in the heights above! Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. 
Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them for ever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 24 Saying 20. Do not envy the wicked, do not desire their company. For their hearts plot violence, and their lips talk about making trouble. Saying 21. By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Saying 22. The wise prevail through great power, and those who have knowledge muster their strength. Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisers. Saying 23 Wisdom is too high for fools. In the assembly at the gate they must not open their mouths. Saying 24 Whoever plots evil will be known as a schemer. The schemes of folly are sin, and people detest a mocker. Saying 25 If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Saying 26 Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Saying 27 do not lurk like a thief near the house of the righteous. Do not plunder their dwelling place. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Saying 28 Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. Or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. Saying 29 Do not fret because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked, for the evildoer has no future hope and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. Saying 30 Fear the Lord and the King, my son, and do not join with rebellious officials, for those two will send sudden destruction on them and who knows what calamities they can bring. These also are sayings of the wise. To show partiality in judging is not good. Whoever says to the guilty, you are innocent, will be cursed by peoples and denounced by nations. But it will go well with those who convict the guilty, and rich blessing will come on them. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. Do not testify against your neighbor without cause. Would you use your lips to mislead? Do not say, I'll do to them as they have done to me. I'll pay them back for what they did. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. 
Thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man.